Good morning, everybody. That was a good uh, introductory song there, I thought. I wanted to let that one play all the way through. But uh, this morning, I'm going to give you a series of lessons, actually going to start a series of lessons uh, that I think are very uh, pertinent for the times in which we live. And I believe these lessons will really help the Bible-believing Christian to properly analyze and discern the things that are going, around, uh, going on around him and be able to make right decisions. And it's been said that one of the hardest things in the Christian life is finding the right balance on things. And regardless of where that falls on your list of the top 10 hardest things in the Christian life, I think that most of us can attest to the truth of that statement that finding a proper balance in things pertaining to this life and being a Christian and what God wants us to do um, isn't always easy isn't always instantly known you know sometimes we we wonder about these things as christians you know we should have a desire to please the lord and obey the lord and if you profess to be saved and you don't have any desire to please the lord or obey the lord in anything uh there's something wrong with your spirit i'm not saying you're not saved but you're certainly not walking in the spirit because you're you're walking in the flesh because a christian who's walking in the spirit will naturally want to please the lord and uh, obey the Lord. And truthfully, given that, you know, God gave his son for us and saved us from hell and has forgiven our sins against him, we Christians have a responsibility to live according to the will of God. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it's called our reasonable service. But as we all know, there are other things in life, you know, that we're all responsible for as well. Uh, many of us are married. We have marriages that we're responsible for. We have jobs that we're responsible for. Uh, we have children that we're responsible for and as and we have all kinds of other responsibilities in life and so the question arises to the bible believer who does want to do something for god the question arises you know how much time should i spend in these things that pertain to god you know how much time should i spend in my bible reading uh, how often should i attend church how much money should i give towards the great commission how involved should i be in the ministry to what extent you know what is it that i'm supposed to do and we all know that god should always come first in all things uh, we are to love the lord our god with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind according to luke chapter 10:27 but the question arises how do i really know if i'm doing that or not am i doing enough it is is where i'm at in my life enough you know that song i wonder have i done my best for jesus you know and that's one of those songs that's like it's it's all the answer is always going to be no you know as far as in our minds but sometimes uh you know what does god think about that and so anyway these are issues that pertain to the balance in your life and sometimes that can be a difficult thing to ascertain at all times and if you've uh does if you have a desire to serve god and, and you want to you know just please the lord with your life you, you know what i'm talking about all right you know some people think you know they, they they look at their own lives and then they look at other christians you know which is never a good idea you're not supposed to compare yourselves among yourselves but you know they say well i mean brother so-and-so is doing way more for god than i am but am i supposed to do that much because if i did as much for god as uh, brother so-and-so you know i couldn't uh, the other things that I'm responsible for would suffer or you know some Christians you know they're in church every time the doors are open and many churches have something going on every single night of the week you know uh, do I need to be there every single time the doors are open some people say you do some people say you don't how much am I supposed to do right uh, some people say you know some Christians are in the full-time ministry but I have a I have to work a secular job so does that mean that you know I'm unbalanced seeing as they're you know fully devoted to God and I'm not you know am I unbalanced or are they unbalanced you know and so these are questions that might come up in your mind once in a while and really what it comes down to is what even is the proper balance who defines that should I neglect all earthly responsibilities to fulfill heavenly tasks you know uh, should I eliminate all earthly possessions to gain only heavenly treasures right some people wonder these things uh, more than others and if i you know the question and you know if i focus on anything that pertains to this life you know this, anything that pertains to this world this life am i sinning for not being a hundred percent sold out for the things that pertain to the next world and the next life am i sinning against god 
Well, I'm guessing that all of you listening are formulating different answers to these questions in your mind, but if we were to get everyone that's tuning in, you know, into the same room and ask them that question and ask them one by one and get a different answer, uh, I think what we'd find is there'd be a variety of answers in a spectrum as to uh, what, what people would think in regards to those things. And the next inevitable question that would come up is, well, who is right? You know, some people say the balance is here. Some people say the balance is here. Some people say the balance is here. The question is who's right and who's wrong and more than likely it just end up in a big argument. Okay, so, so I say all this to illustrate and highlight the concept that finding the proper balance on things is not always as easy as you might think. And you might think that you know what the proper balance is for you and everybody, but put yourself in the other person's situation and it might not be quite so simple. So my goal with these lessons is to help you in this area of discernment. And let me just say that I personally absolutely do not profess to have it all figured out, okay? And the older I get, the more aware I am of this truth. But I do give a lot of thought to these things, and I've recognized that there seems to be some inconsistencies, inconsistencies of thought within conservative and even Bible-believing Christianity. You know, one preacher will get up, you know, and say the proper balance is, you know, this. And then another preacher will get up and say, well, the proper balance is that. And everyone has their reasons and their arguments. And honestly, I'm not capable of telling you what is the exact proper balance for you on issues that pertain to your life. Uh, but what I can do is I can give you some principles and a template that I think will help you with figuring this out. And I'm going to lay out a basic template this morning that's going to be used throughout this lesson and the subsequent lessons uh, in this series. And this temp template is going to be useful for a lot of different subjects that I'm going to cover. And once you get a hold of this template, I think you will understand many of these issues much more clearly than you ever had before. So I'm going to lay out a template for you this morning. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with it. So if you're familiar with the Bible, you know, you've probably noticed that most things in reality come in threes, the trifecta, you know, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Things tend to be in threes, right? You've got sin, transgression, and iniquity in the Bible. You've got heaven, earth, and hell. You've got body, soul, spirit. You've got beginning, middle, end, past, present, future. You've got Shem, Ham, Japheth, uh, sun, moon, stars, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, hot, cold, lukewarm. You've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've got the lust of the eye, uh, the, lust of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, right? Uh, you've got prophet, priest, king. You have all these threes, these patterns of threes that show up throughout the Bible and physical reality. And the template that I want to give you this morning is along the lines of these threes. This is what we would expect, you know, from the Word of God is if you're not sure about something, more than likely the thing comes in a three because that's how most things in the Bible come. And the three things that I'm going to point out this morning are going to be the vertical, the horizontal, and the inverted. The vertical, the horizontal, and the inverted. Okay, the vertical is going to pertain to God. Uh, the horizontal pertains to man, and the inverted pertains to the devil. And what you're going to find throughout this study is that you have essentially the, ver uh, the inverted is black, the vertical is white, and the horizontal is where this gray area comes in, if you will. And truthfully, it's this gray area where we run into most of our problems and confusion in the Christian life and a lot of the strife and contention that comes up <laughs> in the Christian life. Uh, we know that there are some things that are clearly outlined as righteousness, which would be vertical, and there are some things that are clearly outlined as sin, and that'd be the inverted. But when we hit this horizontal area, this is where a lot of the debate comes in. You know, the vertical pertains to heaven, and we know that there's no sin uh, in heaven. It's all good and perfect and righteous and infallible. And the inverted pertains to hell, and we know that uh, there is no righteousness in hell. It's just all sin. It's all bad. It's twisted. It's evil. You know, when it comes to the devil, Jesus said there, there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for, there's no, for there is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of it, right? John 8, 44. Uh, but the horizontal in-between area okay, is the area that pertains to earth, okay? You've got heaven, hell, and 
earth, if you will. And uh, therein abides a spectrum of people and things and issues. And in many cases, there is a mix between uh, a mix of good and bad uh, in every person, thing, and issue. Okay? Some people, some things, and some issues uh, are more righteous and more pure than others. And some people and some things and some issues are more sinful and more impure than others. Few things in this horizontal area are 100% right or 100% wrong or 100% good or 100% evil. Uh, there are usually varying degrees of things, if you will. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning to think about what I'm saying. I know that there's going to be a tendency, especially as Bible believers, there's going to be a knee-jerk tendency to uh, reject you know, what I'm saying this morning. And uh, because you're going to have some thoughts in the back of your mind, well, what about this and what about that? And I'll get to that, okay? I'm a Bible believer, so I, know, I already know what you're thinking. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm going to cover it. But if you'll listen, I think you'll, and if you'll listen to what I'm trying to convey, maybe uh, the words that come out of my feeble tongue, you know, aren't going to be framed properly. But if you'll listen to what I'm trying to convey, the truth that I'm trying to get across, I think it'll help you. And I think you'll learn something. Um, the thing that you really need to get more than anything is, at least in this series of lessons, is that there are three areas. There are not two areas. There are three areas. And if you can get that, and if you can acknowledge that these three areas do exist and are different from one another, you are well on your way to finding the proper balance in your life. You say, well, I already knew that. I already, I already knew that. Well, did you, though? Uh, I, too, you know, would say, oh, yeah, I already knew that. But when you take a step back and you analyze your own outlook and your own perception of things, I can't help but wonder sometimes if we Bible believers have a bad habit of always trying to sort out the horizontal so as to, you know, everything in this horizontal area, we try to either put in the vertical or put in the inverted, and the goal is to eventually eliminate the horizontal to the point where we only have two areas instead of three. You know, we don't like this horizontal area here because it causes some confusion and some questions and some differences in opinion. And so sometimes we try to get rid of it in order to make things a little bit easier for ourselves and easier to figure out. You know, we have a tendency as Bible believers, we want things to either be black or white, right? We want everything to either be good or be bad, okay? We want everything to be either of God or of the devil. And we try to classify things accordingly. And so we approach this horizontal box and everything we pick out, we either stick into the vertical box or we stick into the horizontal box. You know, anything in life that comes across our desk, it's like, oh, it either goes here or it goes here, right? To the point where we want to just make it so that there isn't this anymore. Because if you only have black and white, if you only have two areas, well, that's easy. And then everybody can uh, be agreed, right? Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, for example, when we try to sort out this uh, horizontal area into either the vertical or the inverted, let me give you some examples of some things in the horizontal realm. How about uh, television? Television. Does television go into the vertical box or does it go into the inverted box? How about uh, women's pants? <laughs> Does that go in the vertical box or the inverted box? Oh, how about women's leggings? Ooh. Does that go in the vertical box or the inverted box, right? Uh, smartphones. Where does that go? How about the internet? How about a college education? How about joining the military for a career? How about music? How about uh, fast food? Fast food. Inverted box or uh, vertical box? How about uh, kombucha? Oh, man. How about uh, pharmaceuticals such as aspirin, Tylenol, you know, antidepressants? How about uh, vaccines? You know, and so on and so on. Now, I want you to take a pause and just examine yourself there. Examine yourself, okay? As I was going through these things, were you in your mind putting them, categorizing them into the vertical and the inverted box. You probably were. And all of us have a tendency to do that, truthfully. We all have a tendency to do that. Now, I'm not saying that everything I just mentioned, you know, is willy-nilly and none of those things matter, okay? I'm not saying that. All I'm pointing out here 
is our tendency to want to eliminate the horizontal so that there are only two areas left and there's only black and white and there's no more gray. Okay? And what you're doing is you're trying to essentially slap a label on everything and anything so that you can conform your life to a certain way. Right? And then you can, once you've conformed your life to a certain way and you've figured, figured everything out and you know that there is no horizontal, there's only vertical inverted, now you can also tell others and try to get others to conform to your understanding of vertical and inverted. And uh, sometimes that's what a lot of preaching is. <laughs> it's just, you know, an elimination of this, and now the goal is to try to convince you to believe the way I believe. All right? Now, what happens is it's a way of turning non-commandments into commandments of God. It's a way of changing that area. It's a way of... Uh, it gets into the area, let me put it this way, it gets into the area of changing liberty of choice into the compulsion of laws. Okay, uh, Laws that are not outlined in the Bible, uh, much less the New Testament. Okay, uh, Essentially, when you try to eliminate the horizontal and categorize everything into the vertical or the inverted, you inevitably wind up changing tradition, the commandments of men, which may not necessarily be bad or wrong, uh, they may just be decent traditions, but when you take the, the traditions of men pertain to this horizontal area, but when you try to eliminate the horizontal area, you've got to put the traditions of men somewhere, and if it's a good tradition, well, it certainly isn't going to go here. It's our tradition. It's our Baptist heritage, you know, and so it's got to go here because there is no more horizontal for it to be at. All right, so what happens is the traditions of men end up getting elevated to the commandments of God, and now, therefore, if you don't keep my tradition, you are sinning against God. You see what happened? That's what the Pharisees were doing. You end up changing tradition into commandment, and you make the commandments of men equal with the commandments of God. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. God created heaven. And God created hell. We know that. And God created earth. God created earth. There are three levels in existence, and these three levels are in existence according to the will of God right now. It is God's will that there are three levels. Uh, if God didn't want three levels right now, and if God only wanted two levels right now, He would do that. Someday there will only be two levels. Someday, as we know in the New Jerusalem, there's only going to be two levels. There's going to be heaven and earth as one, you know, New Jerusalem coming down to the earth and heaven and earth are together. Uh, and then there's going to be the lake of fire, right? Two levels, okay? Uh, but we, we don't get to that until we get past the great white throne judgment. And until then, we have to deal with three separate areas and we need to accept that because... That is how God has the things set up. God set it up that way. And you need to conform your thinking in accordance to the way God has things set up. So the first application of this template that I want to get into this morning is in the application of light. And if you will, turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. We'll turn to a few different verses, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and there is, uh, let's see, there's, there's physical light, and uh, we know that. We, this is the kind of light that we can see with our eyes, and sometimes this light is called glory in the Bible, uh, or it's described with that kind of terminology, physical light that you can see with your eyes that uh, comes into your eyeballs and you can see with your eyes. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul said, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, okay, he was referring to the Old Testament, all right, uh, if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, right? That's what he's talking about there. We know that from the account in Exodus that Moses' face shone brightly, and he had to have a veil over his face. But when he came down from the Mount Sinai, his face was glowing, and people could see that brightness, and Paul calls it glory there. Now, the reason why I point that out, because in 1 Corinthians 15, look at what we have. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. 
uh, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. And essentially, Paul is just saying, hey, we know that there's the sun and the moon and the stars, and they each have varying degrees of brightness, is essentially what he's saying there. And, uh, what, and so we know that there's a varying degree, but then there's also spiritual light, right? So you got the physical light, and then you got spiritual light, and we read about spiritual light in the Bible. And this spiritual light in the Bible has a few different applications, one of which is the light of, I'm just going to write it right here. Uh, when it comes to light in the Bible, uh, there's the light of temporal life, okay? The human being that has life, whether they're saved or not, has light in, the, in that sense of the, having the breath of life from God, that breath of life spirit from God. Uh, Job 3.20 said, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life, physical life, unto the bitter in soul. Okay, so he connects light with life. And that's not talking about salvation. That's not talking about the Holy Spirit in you, making you born again. You know, it's, that's not that kind of light. It's talking about physical life, uh, the breath of life in you. Uh, it has to do with light, okay? Uh, the, the babies that are never born, that are either aborted or miscarried, it, the Bible says in Job that they never saw the light, okay? They never had that physical life because they weren't born, right? Uh, anyway, this, the light of eternal life, okay? Eternal life, that's another kind of light that we find in the Bible, and John 8, 12, uh, that has to do with the, the Holy Spirit coming into a person and a person being born again. That's a spiritual light as well. John 8, 12 says, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All right, well, the people that don't follow Jesus already have the light of life, according to Job. So obviously, Jesus is talking about a different light. It's the light of the Holy Spirit. It's the light of eternal life. Okay, that's the life that, the light of life that he's talking about there in that context. All right. Then you also have another uh, application of light, and it has to do with uh, understanding in the Bible. All right. You have the light of understanding. The Bible says in Psalms 19.8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. All right, now that's not your physical eyes, that's your spiritual eyes. That gives you enlightenment in your understanding. The Bible gives you light. When you read the Bible, you get light. It doesn't mean that it, you get physical light into your eyeballs or anything. It's, that's not what it's talking about. It, but when you read the Bible, you're getting the light of the Word of God coming into your understanding. That gives you an understanding and a discernment of things in this life. Uh, Ephesians 1.17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your head... No. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's your mind. The eyes of your mind, if you will. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And then Psalms 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. Not physical light. Uh, spiritual light. Giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. All right? Then you also have the light of truth, okay, in the Bible, the light of truth. Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the reason why I separate this understanding from truth is when you read the word of God and you believe the word of God, you get light, you get understanding. But the person that reads the word of God and doesn't believe it and rejects what it says, uh, he he still had, uh, the, the light was still there. It doesn't mean that it's not light anymore because he rejected it. It is light. It's just that he rejected the light and he didn't get the understanding. But the truth, the light of truth was still there. Okay? Uh, if God's word is a light in and of itself, regardless of whether anybody believes it or not, if no one believed the Bible, that would not make it any less of a light. It's still light whether anybody understands it or not. It's still truth, whether anybody 
comprehends it or not. The Bible says in Psalms 43, 3, O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Okay? So, as you can see here, the first two go together as far as this application of light. And these second two go together as far as this application of light. The, these two are more connected. Okay? Life, temporal life, eternal life, understanding and truth. And those are kind of the breakdown of those categories there. All right? And it's essentially this second area that I want to draw your attention to when it comes to this application of light. Where this, the title of this lesson today is Vertical, Horizontal, and Inverted as it applies to the subject of light, as it applies to the subject of truth and understanding. Okay? Now, uh, essentially, truth is light. Truth is light. Truth is spiritual light that illuminates the understanding of man. Um, uh, the Word of God is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. The Word of God is all truth. Okay? Uh, Psalm 119, 151 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments, all thy commandments, are truth. Psalms 119, 160, Thy Word is true, from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. All right, so this Bible is 100% truth. This Bible is vertical light. This Bible is infallible truth. It is absolute truth. It is divine truth that came from God. And it's not just, it doesn't just contain truth. It is the truth. Every single word of every single page in this Bible is truth. Okay? It is light. And the gospel, for example, falls under the classification of the word of God, right? And it, the gospel is called the light of of the glorious gospel of Christ that shines upon the darkened, spiritually blinded minds of men. Okay, so the gospel is light. So this light and this truth of the word of God, the gospel, and, and the scriptures, okay, this is vertical light. Vertical light is pure, is perfect, is infallible, it is divine. Okay, so those scriptures, let me, let me do something here. I'm going to erase this. All right. So when it comes to this vertical light, it has to do with God, and it has to do with the scriptures, okay? All right, and then this horizontal area pertains to man and the earth. Uh, this inverted area pertains to uh, the devil. I'm going to put uh, heaven. I'm going to put the earth. I'm going to put hell, okay? You see what I'm getting at there? Now, we know that we have the vertical light. We know that the Word of God is perfect. Now, and we know that the Word of God is light. But here's a question that I want to ask, that I want you to think about. Is there any light outside of this light? Is there any truth outside of this truth? That's an interesting question. Now, if one person said, no, there is no other light outside of the light of the Word of God, in one sense they would be correct. But if another person said, yes, there is light outside of the Word of God, in one sense that person would be correct. Now, you're going to have to hang with me here because I know what some of you are thinking. Consider the first person's response. There's no light outside of, the, there's no light or no other truth outside of the Word of God. Now, Truthfully, that is a pretty extreme position. You know, that's a pretty absolute position that essentially dismisses anything and everything outside of the Bible. And basically, anything and out, everything outside of the Bible is completely irrelevant. Okay? And in a very narrow sense, there is an element of truth to that. And in comparison to divine truth, certainly, any other truth outside of the Bible is nothing. And you see this concept in 2 Corinthians 3, where we just were, uh, where Paul is comparing the light of the New Testament to the light of the Old Testament. And bear in mind that both are the Word of God. Okay, It's not like the Old Testament law, moral law is not the Word of God. It most certainly is. But look at what, second, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 
verse 9. He says, For if the ministration of condemnation, which is, you know, the law, the Old Testament, be glory, it's, it's light, okay, much more doth the ministration of righteousness, the, the New Testament, exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious, the Old Testament, Paul says, had no glory. It had no light. The Old Testament had no glory, no light, quote, in this respect, in this context, in this narrow context, Paul's saying the Old Testament had no light by reason of the glory that excelleth. Okay? So in other words, the Old Testament was light. I mean, we wouldn't argue that. It was God's light even. It was the Word of God. But the New Testament light is so far beyond that Old Testament light that the Old Testament might as well have had no light in this respect. Okay? That, that little phrase... In this respect is very important in that passage. But get this, okay? Just because the New Testament light far outshines the Old Testament light, that doesn't therefore mean that the Old Testament has no light. Oh, it just has no light, okay? It did have light, and it does have light, but when we're talking within the context of comparison, in that narrow context of comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Old Testament has no light <laughs> in comparison, okay, by reason of the glory that excelleth in the New Testament. So, that simple thing that I just tried to relate to you, that comparison context, is very important that you get a hold of that, because that simple concept is a pattern that's going to be repeated throughout this template that I'm going to give you. Uh, allow me to illustrate this real quick. Paul knew that the Old Testament did indeed have glory, and it did indeed have light, right? But when compared to the New Testament, it had, quote, no glory, no, no light. So Paul acknowledged that the, Old, that the New Testament had light, but he also acknowledged that the Old Testament did have light, okay? Paul did not conclude in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that since the New Testament was a great light and he did not conclude that since the New Testament was a great light therefore the Old Testament was not light was never light and is actually dark light that wasn't Paul's conclusion that's not what he's saying no he recognized each light for what it was he separated the lights and he put them into their own category the Old Testament has light and the New Testament has light. But if we were to, in the context of comparing the two, well, in comparison, the Old Testament has no light. But outside of the comparison context, there's certainly light in the Old Testament. But what happens, let me ask you this, what happens when someone comes along and concludes that the glorious light of the New Testament has done away with all the light of the Old Testament law? And I'm referring to the nine uh, commandments, the nine moral commandments, the moral aspects of the Old Testament law. I'm not referring to the uh, statutes and the ordinances. I'm not, in this context, I'm not referring to that. But let's say somebody in the New Testament, a born-again Christian, comes along, you know, and says, well, the New Testament is so much more glorious than the Old Testament that, uh, you know, uh, we, have, we are now in the glorious liberty of the New Testament, so we can steal and we can murder and we can commit adultery and we can covet all we want because the Old Testament light is done away with. Right? <laughs> well, what has that person done? Well, number one, he's failed to acknowledge that the, tr the truth that there is light in the Old Testament moral law, certainly. Uh, he, number two, he has taken the higher light. He has claimed the higher light at the expense of the other light. And number three, in an attempt to be fully dedicated to the higher light, he has eradicated the lesser light, which is not what God intended. And what is the result? What is the result of a person that says, well, I'm in the New Testament, so I don't have to even listen to those uh, nine commandments? And I say nine, not the Ten Commandments, I say nine commandments, because the fourth commandment of remember the Sabbath uh, is not a moral commandment. That was a special commandment to the Jewish people. So the nine moral commandments. You have a guy, I'm, I'm born again, I'm a, I've got Jesus in my heart, so I don't, you know, and Jesus has done away with all that, and the, and the light of the New Testament so far outshines the light of the Old that I don't have to worry, I can steal and commit adultery and do anything I want, because I'm in the glorious liberty of the New Testament. What do you have there? Well, you've got a guy that thinks he's devoted to the, the, the new light of the New Testament, but he's anything but in the light. <laughs> he is anything but walking with God. 
He says he is in the liberty of the New Testament, but the New Testament did not eradicate the moral laws of the Old Testament. The ordinances, yes, were taken out of the way, Colossians chapter 2, but not the nine moral commandments. Those commandments are in accordance with God's nature and God's character, and God's nature and character did not change with the advent of the New Testament. He's still the same God. And those moral commandments are still intact, because they're in accordance with God's nature. The moral laws, that, that Old Testament light, is still in existence even to this day. But when that light is eradicated, and just done away with by someone in, a, in an attempt to attain the highest levels of divine light, they end up inverted and walking in darkness. And all the while thinking they are in the light and are fully sold out to God even though they're breaking those nine moral laws, and they say, well, it doesn't matter. No, you're, you, they're inverted. They think they're up here, but they actually are down here and don't even know it. And this is a pattern that you're going to see repeated over and over and over. Um, this is a thesis, if you will, that you know, I'm basically putting forward that, uh, that you're going to see over and over and over. You have to acknowledge the existence of the vertical, the inverted, and the horizontal. You have to, you, you must acknowledge that existence, the horizontal. You must leave them in their proper places. And you must not, you must not eliminate the horizontal in an attempt to devote yourself solely to the vertical. Because if you do that, you are going to wind up inverted every single time. The horizontal is what God has put, put in place to balance us out. If you eliminate God's counterweight of the horizontal because you want only the vertical, you only want the vertical, you know, which is a noble thing. You only want God. You only want the divine. That's all you want in life. Uh, that's a noble idea, right? Um, but if you eliminate God's counterweight of the horizontal because you only want the vertical, you will inadvertently become inverted and you will become the exact opposite of the vertical. Now, let's consider the light of truth a little bit more here. There's a vertical light, a vertical truth, which as I pointed out is divine truth. It's scripture, and it, and it originates from the Spirit of God. And then there's a horizontal light. There's horizontal truth, which is human truth and originates from the human spirit of man, if you will. And then there's inverted light, there's inverted truth, which is demonic truth and is actually lies that masquerade as truth and pretend to be truth, false truth, if you will, fake news, <laughs> and originates from the spirit of Satan, lies. He's the father of lies, right? Um, here's what, uh, so, so you have the vertical light, which is the most brilliant light that there is, no doubt. Then there's the hor there is horizontal light, and it can vary in its brightness, uh, even though it has no comparison when it comes to the divine light, okay, it is still light nonetheless. You need to get that. There is horizontal truth. There is horizontal light. And even though in comparison to this, it is nothing, it doesn't mean it, it is still light and truth nonetheless, okay? And then the inverted light, you might say, is along the lines of black light, you know, if I was to compare it to something, okay? So here's what I want to leave you with, and here's what I want you to think about. There is such a thing as truth and light outside of the Bible. Now, I know if somebody wanted to hang me up as a heretic, you know, they, they'd latch on to that, but I'm asking you to listen and think a little bit about what I'm saying, because... Like I said, I know for some of you, the alarm bells of heresy are sounding off in your head, you know, and you could be right, depending on which respect I'm using that statement in context with, okay? For example, I, I just said that there is such a thing as truth and light outside of the Bible. If I said that in the context of salvation and the gospel, if I said that there was light and truth outside of the Bible in the context of the gospel, and I was saying that there's more than one gospel and there's more than one way to God, more than one gospel light, then yes, that would be heresy. Absolutely. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the light, by the way, when it comes to getting to the Father. In the, in the context of what Jesus said there, I am the way, the truth, and the life, 
the context was coming to the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So yes, in the context of salvation, there is no light or no truth outside of the Bible gospel light in Jesus Christ. Okay? But outside of that context, okay, the, the, the gospel context aside, and in other contexts, there is indeed truth and light outside of the Bible. And chances are you, all, you do already know this, you've just never thought about it that way, or you've never put it into those words. Those words, you know, the, the mouth, uh, the ear trieth words as the mouth taste, tasteth meat, you know, and so when I say that, you're like, mm, I don't know if I believe that, I don't know if I agree with that. That tastes kind of funny, I'm not used to hearing that. And I'm, I'm saying it this way because I want it to come across a little bit blunt, because I want you to think, I want you to think, okay? There is indeed truthful information on a lot of different subjects in a lot of different books written by all kinds of different people. And if truth is light, then there is a certain kind of light that exists in this world among humanity. Okay? You now again, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I thought the Bible said the whole world lieth in darkness. Okay? Yes, that is true. Obviously, the Bible says the whole world lieth in darkness, but that is in the context of sin and salvation. Okay? The whole world, yes, lieth in darkness. Okay? But that does not mean, like maybe Calvin would say, that the whole world is therefore depraved, right? And has no free will and has, uh, it, you know, has no light whatsoever, right? It, that's, that'd be a Calvinistic thing. The Calvinists try to get rid of this horizontal, okay? In the context of sin and salvation, yeah, the whole world lieth in darkness. Uh, but there is truthful light out there that can even be put forth by unsaved people, right? Now, I know you might be fidgeting right now, but like I said, just hear me out. Listen to what I have to say. I'll show you some verses here in just a second. In the context of information, okay, let's leave the context of salvation. We know the context of salvation very clearly. It's black and white. But in the context of information, okay, information, there is truth and there is light, outside of the Bible. There is information that is outside of the Bible that's truthful, okay? Um, that's, that's not necessarily Scripture. Now, listen, there is no light and there is no truth that contradicts the Word of God. That is Anything that contradicts the Word of God and goes directly against the Word of God is certainly going to be inverted black light. It's, it's lies, okay? But there is truth and there is light that is not Scripture, but is in accordance with the Scriptures, or it is in accordance with the Word of God, sure. The information in the Word of God is superior to all other information, certainly. And all other information should be judged and filtered through the Word of God, certainly. But there is other truthful information out there and falls under the category of light. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of stepping on some toes. I'm kind of treading this uh, fine line here, and I understand that. But I am a Bible believer, and so don't worry about that. But, like I said, there's some inconsistencies. That, as I said in the beginning, there's some inconsistencies of thought within conservative and Bible-believing circles along these lines. Inconsistencies. Okay? Inconsistencies. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. And it's not, a, it's not wrong to point out inconsistencies. Okay? It's not wrong to point out, hey, this is a problem. And we ought to address it. Okay? Uh, and rather than just pretend that we have everything figured out and we're right on everything. Okay? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony... If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You say, aha! You see, the word of God is the only light there is, and everything else is darkness. Okay? Well, I know that sounds very spiritual, right? Uh, and I know you sound very sold out for God and very dedicated to God when you say things like that. Uh, but that's not what the verse said. And I want you to think a, a second about what you might be, what you're saying. If you say, "Aha! There's no light outside of the Word of God." Okay, well, this is where the inconsistency comes in, and I want you to think about the ramifications of your statement. There, there's no light outside of the Bible. Okay, therefore, any information outside of the 66 books of the Bible is darkness. Then, right? 
because it's not light. It's not light, right? Because if it's not light, any truth, there, there is no light outside of the Bible. There is no truth outside of the Bible. Therefore, any information beyond the 66 books of this Bible is therefore lies and darkness. That's the only other thing it could be by process of elimination. Okay? And it would have, if it's, and it would have to be from the devil. Okay? And it would have to be evil. And uh, if, it's, if, any truth, if there is no light or no truth outside of the Bible, then therefore any information outside of the Bible is false and untrue and darkness and from the devil and evil. And therefore, the natural conclusion is a Christian should have nothing to do with it. Therefore, take into its logical conclusions, take into its logical conclusions, no Christian, therefore, should ever go to college, right? Because that's outside of the Bible. And no Christian should ever watch the news, right? That, that's the logical conclusion of what you're saying. No Christian should ever watch the news. Uh, no Christian should ever watch a documentary, unless it's a Bible documentary, uh, and no Christian should waste his time reading any other book than the Bible. And it even gets to the point where you shouldn't watch or listen to any person other than some saved King James Bible believer. Don't even listen to anybody else. Because they can't possibly be saying anything that's true. Now, some Christians do think that way. But if you're sane, uh, you know that this is ridiculous. Okay, And yet some of you agree that there is no light outside of the Bible, and yet you disagree with the logical conclusions of your own belief. You are inconsistent. You haven't thought through the ramifications of what you're saying, and what I'm giving you this morning is, caught, is kind of banging up against the way you're, you normally think, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to think and see the inconsistencies of your own way of thinking. Uh, if there is no light outside of the Bible, no truthful information outside of the Bible, then it follows that everything outside of the Bible is darkness, and you should have nothing to do with it. Now, what is that? Well, what that is, is that's a devotion, a desire for devotion to the vertical at the expense of the horizontal, and as a result, you will become inverted. <laughs> now, look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 again. Okay, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, did you get that? That's not what the verse said. I left something out there. If that's what it said, if it said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not this word, it is because there is no light in them, then yeah, uh, everything that's not inspired scripture is darkness. But that's not what the verse said. The verse said this, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they speak against this word, then certainly it's darkness. But you, there is such thing as speaking according to the word of God. There is the word of God, vertical, and then there are things that are according to or in accordance with the Word of God, and that's hor that can be horizontal light. Okay, It's horizontal light. It's according to the Bible. It's consistent with the Bible. Even though it's not necessarily inspired Scripture, it is in accordance with the Word of God and with the nature of God. It's just a, a, l a lesser light, if you will, but and it's not vertical light, but it is light nonetheless. Now, there's a lot of information out there that is according to or in accordance with or consistent with the Word of God. When someone speaks against the Word of God or puts out false truth or something that goes completely contrary to the Word of God, uh, that indeed is darkness. That is not light. And it doesn't matter who says it or, or anything like that. If it's directly contrary to the Word of God, then it's darkness. Okay? Lies are darkness. Truth is light. Truth of divine Scripture is divine light. Truth outside of Scripture... Did you get that? Truth outside of Scripture is according to divine light, but is not divine light in and of itself. When someone, saved or lost, saved or lost, speaks things that are true, that are righteous, that are pure, that are just, that are lovely, that are honest, 
they are speaking in accordance with the light. Because this book is all truth. This book is all pure. That commandments are very pure, the Bible says, right? It's all, it's all perfect, okay? And when someone isn't, they're not quoting scripture, but they're thinking, they're speaking things that are true and honest and pure and, and all that, and that's in accordance with the word of God. That's in accordance with the nature of God, okay? Their words are not divine light, okay? Their words are not inspired scripture, their words are not from the Holy Spirit in them speaking through them. Okay, not no. But their words are according to or in accordance with the Scripture, and therefore they are light, albeit a lesser light, if you will. Okay? They are light. This is light. Okay? Vertical light is the Word of God. Horizontal light are things that are, that are according to the Word of God, if you will. And inverted light are things that are contrary to the Word of God. Look at it again in Ephesians chapter 5. We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This lesson is a little bit longer because I had to give an introduction and then this thing about the light. Um, the subsequent lessons, I think, will be a little bit shorter. That's my goal, anyway. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. It says, For ye were sometimes darkness, unsaved, but now are ye light in the Lord. You're saved. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. All right? So he's talking about you as a Christian, your deeds and your character as a Christian. You ought to be good, righteous, and truthful person. Verse 10, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Okay? So the works of darkness are bad, evil, untruthful deeds, and those deeds should be reproved. Okay? Verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Okay? So if it's a shame to even speak of the things that they do in secret, uh, certainly it is much, how much more of a shame is it for a Christian to commit those things or do those things himself? Uh, verse 13, but all things, look at verse 13, get verse 13, Ephesians 5, 13. <laughs> but all, 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 all things that are reproved, okay, so the it's referring to all uh, evil things, you know, for the most part. But all things, all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Now look at this. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Okay? Now I want you to think about that and really chew on that verse. It says, but all things that are reproved. Okay, reproof has to do with correction and instruction in the Bible. Proof ha uh, reproof has to do with a confrontation with the purpose of correction. Uh, reproof is not sharp you know, and forceful like a rebuke is, but it's still standing up to uh, lies and untruthfulness and wrongdoing. Okay? And the way you reprove something is by making it manifest. That is, you expose it. The person uh, is hiding it and you're bringing it out into the open. You're confronting what is false with what is true and you're bringing the truth alongside the lie and revealing the lie for what it is. Okay? That's the reproof that you're making manifest by light. And we know that the Bible does that certainly. Obviously, the Bible is certainly uh, does all those things I just described. But get this. Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Anything that exposes lies is, quote, light according to the Bible. Anything that exposes lies is light. You need to get that. Lies equal darkness. Truth equals light. There are a lot of things beside the Bible that expose lies. There are a lot of groups that are not even Christian, but they are they're in opposition to wicked deeds, and they expose wickedness and punish wickedness. For example, the police, when, you know, when they're doing what they're supposed to do, you know, let's just take for granted uh, righteous police and police that are upholding uh, law and order, okay? The police, they reprove evil deeds all the time, do they not? Absolutely. Uh, there's a number of conservative people in media, and even in alt-right media, that expose lies all the time. I mean, you think about Project Veritas and James O'Keefe, his whole career is, is, is exposing 
lies and bringing things to light that people are trying to keep hidden, right? If you know anything about what, he's, what he does, I don't even know if that guy's saved. <laughs> Who I, I, I hope he's saved. But I mean, when it comes to uh, light and making things manifest, he is, he is doing, he's making things manifest. All thi uh, what does it say? Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Is, he's making ma things manifest. He's bringing to light the, the evil works of darkness and lies. So, that, that organization is putting out light according to your Bible. According to the Holy Spirit. Okay? You need, to get, you need to get some of this. You need to understand some of this. Some guys uh, out there, you know, let's just say unsaved media people. You know, for example, some guys uh, expose, uh, expose lies more than others. You know, some of them do a better job at exposing lies than others. But nevertheless, there are unsaved men whose whole career is making manifest the works of darkness. Bringing evil things to light so that they can be judged accordingly. And according to the Bible, that is light, because whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Do you believe that word, whatsoever, Mr. Bible Believer? That's what it says in your King James Bible. It may not be vertical light. Okay, We know what the vertical light is, and, and it may not be vertical light that we're referring to here, but it's still light nonetheless. I think Project Veritas is a really good example. They're just bringing a bunch of things that evil men are trying to keep hidden, criminal activity, and they're exposing it for the whole world to see. And they're reproving it. They're saying, this is wrong, and we want to bring it to light. Okay? Project Veritas is not vertical light. It's not scripture. It's not divine. Okay? But it is light nonetheless because it is uh, making things manifest. It is reproving the works of darkness, and that is light according to the Bible albeit it's a separate light from this light it's a lesser light but it is still light nonetheless okay it may not be vertical light but it is light nonetheless and it is what I would call horizontal light now let me wrap up with this just because it's not vertical light doesn't therefore make it darkness you must not have the mindset that anything that isn't vertical light is inverted light. Okay? You must not ignore the relevance of horizontal light, even if it has little relevance in your opinion. You must still acknowledge that it does have some relevance. Okay? You must not dismiss the existence of horizontal light. You must not get rid of this right so that you only have one or the other you can't you you can't do that you're going to mess yourself all up you say well i want to be a hundred percent devoted to vertical light and i will show my devotion by eliminating all horizontal light and pretending it doesn't even exist and any and every supposed truth outside of the bible is untrue and is a lie right well what you're doing is what you're doing is Let's see. All right. So you just want this because you want to be Mr. Spiritual. All right. And so you're making this massive division between these two. And you're saying this is the only light there is. And I want to be devoted to this light. All right. Well, what you're doing is you're making the horizontal equal with the inverted. Okay. You're eliminating the. You're trying to eliminate the horizontal because when you do that, when you say it's either this or that, essentially you've eliminated that, and it's either this or that, and, and is really what you're doing. You're you're making either good or evil, and there is no uh, horizontal, okay, if you will. And you're trying to make it one or the other, and uh, you're eliminating something that God has put in place and has allowed for. And what happens when a Christian tries to eliminate the horizontal? He eventually becomes inverted himself. When you eliminate the horizontal, you become inverted yourself, even though you think you're vertical. So give this some thought. 
think about this template and practice superimposing it over various areas of life. And that's what I'm going to do in these next lessons. You're going to see that this template fits so many things. And I think if you'll just consider this template and you're thinking, you'll start to discern uh, these three areas and uh, many of the things that perhaps you had questions about in the Christian life will start to make a lot more sense in this template. And uh, we'll get into it a little bit more next week and I'll show you some more areas where this applies next week. But like I said, take Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13 and think about that verse. Chew on it. Read it. Reread it. And then think about this template and try to see how it fits in different areas of your life. So thank you for tuning in. God bless you. See you next week.